Hello, everyone. Welcome to Sounds from the Studio, brought to you by Contemporary Craft. Contemporary Craft fosters the use of traditional craft materials such as ceramic, fiber, glass, metal, and wood to make art. Our community honors the history and heritage of craft while showcasing modern, exploratory work. And since our organization is located in Pittsburgh, PA, we decided to bring some of the stories of our exhibiting and studio artists to a broader audience by way of this podcast. I'm Rachel, the Executive Director at Contemporary Craft. And I'm Camila, a podcaster and art enthusiast. We are your hosts for this journey, and there are many ways to keep up with us. You can go to the Facebook page and like it, Contemporary Craft, on Twitter at SCCPGH, Instagram at SCCPGH, or just go to contemporarycraft.org. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts. We just ask that you please follow, rate, and review, and also share, share, share alike. So with the summer season underway, we have a series of workshops that are happening in our studios. These hands-on experiences offer a professional artist and novice, novice hobbyists alike the opportunity to learn new skills or hone their craft. The majority of our classes are taught by artists from the Pittsburgh region and neighboring states, but through our visiting artist program, we also offer a series of workshops taught by professional artists that are from around the country, and sometimes we also welcome international artists as well. So the guest on our podcast today happens to be one of these visiting artists who's going to be teaching with us this summer. Yes, welcome to Tanya Crane. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm actually in the middle of teaching a workshop. It's kind of the lunchtime, so uh, it's, it's the last day, so it's one of those those times where it's you're kind of looking back throughout the week and seeing all the progress that people made. And it's exciting. Um, it's exciting that, you know, I've got six new people that I've influenced and made into enamelists extraordinaires. And so um, I look forward to seeing their work in the future. That's got to mean a lot to you. Yeah, it's, it's really exciting. These are actually the um, chaperones and then the, um, the partners of the other instructors. So um, I'm teaching this workshop is part of crafting the futures. Um, it's called uh, the art or craft takeover mm-hmm. and um, crafting the future is just this amazing organization started by Corey Pemberton and Annie Evelyn. And it's to raise money for artists of color to take workshops of their choice at any of the, um, any of the workshop centers across the country. And this particular one, we've actually brought, or they actually brought um, 30 young people in high school to the Tennessee Tennessee Tech's um, Contemporary Craft uh, School. And um, we, a group of, I think, four instructors are teaching various skills. So it's it's been a, an amazing week and it's, I mean, it's changing lives, definitely. Wow. Well, congrats for a successful workshop experience uh, and you're wrapping it up now and um, I'm sure you're on to all sorts of new and exciting things and um, I guess we'll kind of get into that here today. Yeah. Yeah, Tonya, thanks so much for taking the time out of your your workshop schedule and everything you got going on. I'm I'm really looking forward to talking with you today. I've been following your work for a while. Was really happy to show a piece uh, and approaching exhibition a few years ago, and also just happen to know that you went to school with my wife way back in the day at New Pulse. So, um, yep. kind of a fangirl here, excited to get to learn a little bit more about you. Um, so, I mean, to dive in, I guess I, I'm curious. You know, you're pretty prolific in both sculpture and jewelry making, and I'm really curious if you have a preference for one over the other. Uh, I definitely prefer jewelry over sculpture. Um, I think sculpture is something I just uh, dabbled in in grad school. Um, When you have that time and and kind of the push to explore material. Um, I do think about making sculptures, but it's always kind of size limited. And so um, I kind of feel that my jewelry is always sculptural visually. So I'm, I'm addressing it without addressing it in a more traditional way, I guess you would say. But yeah, jewelry is my jam, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, and so in follow-up then, I guess, if jewelry is, is your jam, um, it's often identifiable to me by your mark making and the textures that are created in that work. 
um, I, I'm curious to know about that as well. Like, is there something specific to those textures or that mark making? Is it purely aesthetic? What What's going on with the design, I guess, is what I'm asking. Yeah, so um, when I was in grad school at University of Wisconsin-Madison, I um, was looking for a way to make like a striking contrast of color. And I chose black and white as my colors of choice. And I was looking at Western African graffiti work or graffito work. And, um, and I was looking at just kind of images of like African mark making in general. And um, I kind of landed on black and white. And um, I was also looking for a way to do graffito in enamel that was quicker than the more traditional way. So I started using oils to mix with my, um, my enamel paints instead of using liquid enamel, which is a kind of a whole different process, which um, required more waiting time, less precise line, less saturated color. And so when I landed on the oils with the, with the black enamel, um, I never looked back. Like, I feel like it, it makes its statement. It complements everything. It complements stones. It complements natural materials. It complements fiber. Um, it's recognizable. And yeah. people use graffito in, in ceramics. They use graffito in wood. They use graffito in glass. And so, um, so I'm speaking a kind of universal art and craft language. Um, and I'm being kind of more specific to a culture. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I just... I think there's endless ways for me to expand on the idea. And so I just, I'm just going to keep doing this until I get sick of it, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, it is, it's also, I mean, it's beautiful. I love the work and it is so like identifiable. It does stand out. Like when you wear that piece, people say, oh, Tanya Crane made that work. Uh, and to your point, it, it kind of, you know, depending on your personal aesthetic or fashion sense, you can kind of work with it and tie it into just about anything. It's great work. So and kind of in relation to that, all of your pieces, from what I can tell, they all seem to be like very strong and bold and there's not much dainty about any of them. And um, so do you see that as a reflection of your own personality? Ooh, that's a good question. I would say I definitely take risks. Um, I don't, I think that my skill set lends itself well to making bigger work. Um, I don't see myself looking into a microscope to make things like ever in the future. <laughs> um, I'm definitely not going to be one of those stone setters who, you know, like does, <laughs> um, channel setting and pave setting. Like I just, it doesn't interest me at all. Um, yeah, I like lightweight, bold work. And I think that um, it, it does somewhat represent my personality, I guess. I'm a Gemini. Mm. And so I get bored with things. And so I'm, I try new things a lot. Um, and whether or not they make it into a production line of work or they make it into like my uh, like more conceptual art pieces, um, I'm patient with, with that aspect but eventually it will make its way in there. How did you start on the journey of jewelry making? Um, so this is a great story. And I think it's, I just told this last night to the, to the high schoolers. I actually um, started taking metalsmithing classes at Pratt Fine Art Center. So mm -hmm. it was a community-based art center in Seattle. And um, I was curious about metalwork and they had classes that were semi-affordable. And um, I ended up, taking seven years worth of metalsmithing, welding, wow. glass bead making. They offer a ton of stuff there. So um, I took classes for seven years. I did not have a college degree. Um, in my mid thirties, I decided that I wanted to make a living wage. And the only way that I saw to that living wage was to get a degree. And so I ended up transferring my kind of two year uh, AA degree to um, New Paltz. And uh, for two and a half years, I achieved my BFA degree at SUNY New Paltz. And 
I did not know at the time because I was not involved in the kind of art jewelry world that I was learning from like the top teachers in the best program in the country. Wow. Essentially, I was just like, oh, I'm going to get a degree. I was living in New York at the time. So that's the, that's the school I chose. And, um, it totally changed my life. Um, I went from there straight into grad school and, um, graduated when I was 40 years old and, um, applied to be a teacher at a school in Boston and got the gig. And then that has turned into a full-time gig and the rest is history. That's amazing. So from a community, yeah, from a community art center to like a full-blown college professor is like, that's the dream. That's awesome. So in a way, um, <laughs> you said you graduated from college at 40. So I feel like, do you feel, do you feel like that you are better off waiting later in life to go through this process? Or, or do you think like if you had done it sooner, had done the same thing earlier on, you wouldn't have appreciated it more. You wouldn't have stuck like it should, or, you know, anything like that. For me personally, I was not in a, in a, a stage of my life when I was 18 or 19, that college would have done anything for me. I tried it for a semester. I completely flunked out. Um, I, I was not interested in it. I was bored. I had zero clue that art could be a degree that you pursued. Right. I just was just doing what all my, like my fellow high schooler friends were doing. They're like, you go to college. I'm like, cool, I'll try that. And it did not work out for me. Um, I did like, I lived three lives before I went to college. Right. You know, I was like, <laughs> I did everything from, um, working on a fishing vessel when I was 19, um, in Alaska, like in the middle of the ocean, wow. um, to being a postal worker for six months, then deciding that was like actually <laughs> harder work than working on the fishing vessel. Um, I, I was like, Oh, I want to be a chef. So I went to culinary school and I did that for a year, got a degree in that. And I couldn't find a job doing that. Cause that's more about who, you know, than like what you can do. Um, I was a teaching assistant um, for special ed students for mm. seven years in the Seattle public school system. So like I did, I lived, like I have experiences that I can now add to my work that like somebody who goes right from high school to college to a career does not. Right. So I, I really encourage my students who are 19 and 20 to get experience, you know? Right if on. The college degree is, is what they're being told that they need to get, great, get that degree, but then go have some experiences, come back later in life to get your other degrees if you need them. You may not. Yeah, because I, I personally have always thought it was just wild that, you know, at 18, we're expected to know what we want to do with the rest of our lives and, you know, go on for more schooling. Yeah. And it's just like, that's a lot of responsibility. Um, so. It really is. It really is. Well, and it's interesting, too, when we talk about, like, you have such a defined aesthetic. Um, you've kind of come to it at a place where you're able to say, this is what I know, this is what I like, this is where I want to go from a place of confidence that, you know, because of that lived experience in some in some ways, at least, I think, I don't know, for myself at least anyway, the, the older I get, the more easy it becomes to like pick a direction and feel like a sense of like, that's that's what I'm doing. Yeah. That's where I'm going. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, you talked a little bit about like the production work versus art jewelry and coming to this place of like knowing art jewelry. Um, can you talk a little bit about like, are you, are you still making art jewelry? Are you just making production work? And, um, you know, some of your work that is along the lines of that, the larger statement pieces is just like incredibly compelling and starts to walk that sculptural line a bit more. So, um, yeah, I'm just curious in terms of your practice, you know, do you balance those two things? It is hard to balance them. It's very easy to make production work all the time. It's what I do to warm up in the studio on a daily basis. Um, but I do make more conceptual work at a slow rate during these times um, of production and 
I actually had to like kind of slow myself down in the last couple of years because I was starting this, this full-time career as a professor and like trying to figure out that balance. Um, and I was kind of overworking myself. And so I, I, I figured out that I don't have to make work at the same rate as you do in school. Like there you're working on a semester system, you're working towards a thesis. And so you have like a set parameter of time. Now I'm, I'm appreciative of, of um, galleries and museums that will reach out and give you like a two year heads up, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which I, rec I recently gotten, um, which is amazing. Like, and so I'm like been thinking about and kind of slowly working towards making six pieces for a show that I know that I have two years down the line. Or, and I'm appreciative of places that are like, come look at our collection and can you respond to that? And we have a space for you in 2024. I'm like, yes, thank you so much. <laughs> um, I'm gonna agree. Um, I, I, that's kind of where I'm at like pace wise for making work. Um, I, I'm not in any kind of rush. Um, and the inspiration is always there because I'm really inspired by natural materials and my landscape and like just my life. And so I don't feel the kind of urgency that I used to feel to make this work. Um, I do though make the production work so I stay relevant. So people see what I'm doing, you know, like, so it's out there, it's not forgotten. Um, also, I put it out there. I, I get a lot of tips from Arthur Hash, who like everything he does, he puts out on the web and that's so people like aren't stealing your ideas mm. and, you know, mm make making your thing at the same time you're making your thing so you know you can call people out in that way too if um if you do see that happening which it has happened a couple times actually in this last year really that's interesting do you find mm -hmm. is it more like individual artists or i've seen there's kind of like this influx of almost it, it seems of like companies corporations like fast fashion that are starting to make a lot of work that it really resembles you know individual artists so yeah um i've seen it more so i've taught a ton of workshops in the last couple of years ton of online workshops Pre before that a lot of in-person workshops and so you'll see people want to make your work mm -hmm. um and i I very quickly explain, I'm like, I'm showing you this. This is a process that you can use any color for. You don't need to use these colors. You don't need to use the marks that I make. You need to figure out your own visual language. Um, but I do see people that literally like mark for mark, try to copy my work and sell it. And if I see it very quickly. And then I do, I, I write to them. I'm like, and I explain this to them mm -hmm. um, and they take it down and I'm like, they can get somewhere creative. They don't need to recreate what I'm doing. Um, and it's only been a couple people, but I'm sure that there's more out there. So in that vein, I guess what's more compelling for you, the material or the process of what you're doing? Ooh, um, I would say that is equal. Hmm. Um, I, love, I love the process. Um, but the material has endless possibilities. So, um, yeah, I think that they are more on an equal plane for me. Can you know, you I'm showing, I'm showing the process constantly to people in these workshops. Um, but they show me the possibilities when they make work. Like I'm just blown away by what they make with the material that I'm using. You know, I'm just blown away. So can you give, like, for us laymen who have never witnessed said process, um, can you just give, like, a, a brief description mm -hmm. on what that is? Sure. So I'm using um, enamel, which is a pigment, like a mineral pigment mixed with glass uh, powder. And that gets sifted onto copper through a mesh sifter, kind of like a screen. And then it's fired in a kiln at roughly 1,480 degrees Fahrenheit um, till it fully fuses. Only takes a couple minutes, maybe two minutes max. Um, af after I've enameled both sides of the work that I'm intending to mark, make marks on, I um, 
mix up um, a really fine powdered enamel, like a painting grade enamel with various oils to a consistency that allows me to um, scratch through and reveal the color that's underneath. So that's, you know, that's enameling um, in a very short nutshell. <laughs> it's and then I, I do things to the surface to give it texture and to give it um, sparkle after that. It sounds like it can be a very therapeutic process for folks who like to do things like that, you know, just kind of um, not really repetitive, but I guess like scratching at things because <laughs> sometimes <laughs> that's, no, it is no, it is repetitive. It's repetitive in that like the mark making that I do is uh, over and over, and um, I do you know when I'm doing production earrings, I'll do ten pairs of earrings in an hour. So I'm just sitting there making these marks, and then when I, they're all marked, then I do you know firing, and wow. that's in a production mode. I'm like one at a time in the kiln, one at a time, you know, so I don't mess up two by putting two in there. Right. Like I only had the potential of messing up one and then I do my top coat and then, then I clean the earring back and then, you know, then I have cards and it's like a whole thing. If you make production work, you understand like you have to work in a certain way to make it efficient. Wow. It's interesting. Um, you know, kind of talking about your teaching for a minute, enamels are always like a, a crowd pleaser, a contemporary <laughs> crowd. People love taking enameling workshops. I think maybe it is something in that, like that magic of what it looks like before it goes into the kiln and then it comes out and it's really solidified and you, it's shiny, it's all of those things. Um, do you find like is enameling I'm just curious, is that popular kind of across the circuit? Is that something that we just happen to have in Pittsburgh that people are really compelled by? Because I know you're at at a center right now teaching. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, is that, is that what you teach when you go to the various kind of craft schools? Um, yes, uh, my classes generally tend to fill up. And um, during the pandemic, during the time when we were in our homes, I would consistently have like 20 to 30 students in my online classes. Wow. And I would ask like the places I'm like, is this is crazy. Like this is so many people. Like I, I've never, I did not know that like so many people didn't know this process, that so many people were interested, that so many people had kilns at home. Right. Um, <laughs> but in, yeah, enameling is this thing that where like people's, parents like parents my age my parents like my parents age like late 60s they did this in college or they did it uh in high school as like a craft that you could take and um so I think a lot of the the sons and daughters of you know my parents age uh folks have access to a kiln or have a kiln that they can use and so um it's it's kind of wild. They're also all over the internet. Like you can find them on Facebook marketplace, eBay, wow. things like that for affordable prices. So a ton of people are picking up enameling. Um, so one of the things that we like to talk a lot about at contemporary craft and so far on the podcast is kind of this idea between the difference um, or what we like to talk about is the difference between art and craft, or if there even is a line between those two things. Um, so as we kind of talked about your production work versus your art jewelry and your sculpture in your own personal practice, do you see any type of distinction between art and craft or is it one and the same for you? Um, I don't see a difference. Definitely. I feel that, um, the intention be behind your, your process and your, your work is there's no difference between the intent of somebody creating a painting versus uh, creating a basket. Um, I feel like there's, there's this desire, there's, there's this intensity within you that you need to make that object. Um, whether or not it's for like somebody to use or somebody to look at, if that's the distinction that the world has made, they can have that. Like it, it doesn't mean that I need to call that art or that, 
craft and give it like a kind of a monetary value based on on usability or, or visibility. Um, I think that equally they require a lot of skill that needs to be honed and skill that needs to be um, taught to others, you know, not um, not hoarded. It needs to be like put out there. Um, yeah, I think that the distinction is something that is is more historical. And I think that it's it's kind of a, a dead topic, honestly, that I don't think um, needs that much more time. I think it's kind of a waste of time to kind of continue to talk about it. Um, yeah, I think that that all of these things need to be put back into schools so that this next generation of people aren't thinking that there is a difference and not valuing one over the other. Um, and that goes for, you know, art should be on the same level as math and that should be on the same level as engineering and the same level as um, science. It all uses your brain to, in, in a way that um, keeps you vibrant. Yeah, well, and I mean, to that point, realistically, they're all interconnected, you know, right. enameling certainly yeah. is using yeah. science and science equally is using creative problem solving, which is, you know, yeah. coming from you the creative side. So yeah, that yeah. makes real sense. I find it so so interesting. I know that you just had a baby and I was just thinking like any parent would I think innately know that creativity is just as important as as figuring out, you know, how many apples are in this container. Like I feel like it's just as important. One seems a little bit more mundane to me, <laughs> honestly, but <laughs> <laughs> but it's but it's necessary. Um, it's necessary to, to to know those kinds of things. But um, you know, the the color and how how a knife affects that apple um, seems like a lot more fun to solve. Right. Yeah. When did you decide or accept that you were an artist? I would say it, it, it's definitely more recent. I think that it's been building. I think I was building the skills mm -hmm. for a long time. I mean, I, I started at Pratt Fine Arts Center in 2000, oh, 2001. Wow. And I think I'm just now like, just now accepting that, okay, I'm an artist. People are looking to me for certain things, education. Um, they're looking to me to learn about process. Um, and, um, my work is out there and I have a responsibility to that work. And so now I'm definitely kind of feeling that like, okay, I'm, I'm an artist. So I have, there's a responsibility with that. Um, it's important that people understand that it's about the practice. It's about the kind of perseverance. It's about like showing up and doing the work to get to a level that is, um, a level of work that is, um, you know, kind of unbreakable mm. in a way. It's it's a level of work that um, that I feel comfortable putting out into the world. Um, that is um, making a statement culturally. It's making a statement socially. So yeah, it's once I reached that in the in these last couple of years, I felt like okay, I'm an artist. <laughs> Well, of all the work that you've done, what do you find to be, if anything, your most compelling? Ooh. Um, well, <laughs> it's actually not jewelry, but it does relate to the body. It's a, it's a jump rope. Mm. Um, and it's a double Dutch jump rope. And it's made out of um, synthetic hair. And then the handles are made out of black dildos. <laughs> and it has... Yep. It, it has a lot of, yep. It, okay. it touches on a lot of like social, like social stigmas. It's to, uh, racial stereotypes, the sexualization of black bodies. Mm -hmm. um, it relates to uh, the black and white aesthetic 
the um, the idea that um, interracial coupling is um, is stigmatized, um, is not fully accepted, I don't think, in this country. Mm. Um, it, the title, Double Dutch, is a children's game, but it also talks about appropriation and um, uh, colonization. So this like piece for me is like, it's my favorite piece. Yeah. Um, I love showing it. It's It gets a lot of reaction. I'm sure. Um, it's, yeah. Well, you, you mentioned, um, <laughs> <laughs> because I saw in your bio that, you know, it, it seems like that you felt like at an early age anyway, and I'm assuming your, your mom is white and your dad is black and that you, in your early age and yes. your early childhood or whatnot, you didn't get as much, um, influence or exposure to black culture as you feel like that you would have liked to have had. Is that... Am I making that? Is yep. that is that true? And how? That's definitely true. Okay. Like my exposure. Go ahead. Go ahead. Ask the question. No, no. I, I want you to go ahead and continue the thought. <laughs> um. So my exposure to black culture was just holidays at my my dad's house or my aunt's house in South Central Los Angeles. So it was completely opposite of my experience. Uh, on the every day and a completely opposite of my um, experience in the town that I was growing up in, which was extremely white. Mm -hmm. Um, It was called Canyon country. It was literally, literally the country. Oh, wow. You know, it was like, I mean, it's more of a city now, definitely, but it's, it was, you know, farm fields and rolling Hills and um, my high school mascot was the cowboy, you know, (laughs) <laughs> it was like you couldn't get more right you couldn't get more rural than right. that i think and then 30 minutes 30 minutes away is south central wow so did you so, find yourself like actively seeking mm-hmm. more exposure to your black roots and black culture as a child no as a child that was just you know this is what i'm i'm driven to this and then i experienced this it's like i didn't act i think that's young people today are more like maybe aware culturally Mm -hmm. of the lack, but I was not like, I was like, this is, you know, I was born in the seventies. So like, I don't know, this is just what I knew. Right. And then, um, as an adult though, as an adult, I definitely seek it out. Like what is the experiences that I need that I was lacking? Like, Mm -hmm how can I expose myself to more cultural experiences that are actually my own culture? (laughs) So I definitely seek those out. And I, I mean, this, for instance, this week here, I've been around more people of color than I have ever. Oh, wow. Every single student is, uh, yeah. Every single student is either black, Spanish, Hispanic, Asian, um, indigenous, Mm. all the teachers, we are all people of color. Like it's, it's, amazing it's amazing that's awesome yeah it's you know and i'm curious about um you know early in our conversation you said that most of the sculptural work you had made in grad school and then is that the double dutch piece is that one of your earlier works i made that in grad school yeah yeah and it was so do you it was part of anything? yeah oh sorry there's another piece on your on your site. I think it's a necklace and it has like a, a hair comb at the end of it, which to me is kind of like this line. It's it's an art jewelry piece kind of crossing that sculptural versus um, functional space. Do you see yourself, if you're looking for more of those experiences or drawing more on, on culture, like... Do you have intention of pulling more of that type of sculptural, contextual work into the jewelry? So I am currently working on um, transcribing some interviews that I have done with my aunt and uncle um, about their experiences, about uh, the life of my father who you know died when I was in middle school. And I've been transcribing that onto enamel and wow. paper. Wow. And so I am working on like kind of putting more of these cultural references into my, into my work 
currently. So that's also like an ongoing project because my uncle, you know, he's still alive and he's, you know, fairly young. And so I was able to record him last summer. I'm hoping to do some more recordings of some other family members, but like they really are, a lot of them are passing away. And so I want to make sure that I re get all this. And then like the larger picture is my interest in like black migration from the Midwest and my family came from Oklahoma and moved to California back in the 40s. So I'm really interested in that story um, and seeing how like black cultural hubs are created mm. and how they, you know, they can be one way or they can be another. And like, how did that kind of evolve? And my uncle's, has, he's got great stories. And so um, I, I want to make sure that I capture all this. Yeah, it's so important to capture, I think. Um, oral history and story and culture and tradition. And I, yeah. I wonder when you show that work or if you show that work, will you share the stories as well? Yeah, um, I actually, so the first piece I made was a necklace and it was on paper. And then the paper was dipped in beeswax. And um, I showed that piece as part of the Museum of Art and Design, they had this, this show called like, like Who's Next, I believe. So they have a, a whole group of work called 40, I can't remember, 40 artists or 40 under 40 or something like that. And they have, um, and it's part of their collection. And um, I showed that piece there and told that story in like an online panel. And um, they were so interested in that piece, which looks nothing like you know, my black and white work, but it, you know, it has to do with, with, with history and a history that a lot of us share in this country. So yeah, I, I do. And the bowl that I just made that I transcribed this, you know, part of an interview with my uncle, I just showed at the um, society of North American goldsmiths. Um, uh, what do they call that show that uh, adorn spaces? Um, and within the Dorn spaces, which is a whole bunch of different shows, there is an enamel society specific um, show about the enamel bowl. And my bowl was actually just, you know, a transcribed interview. So interesting. So uh, this is kind of a question um, in the similar vein, but kind of different topic. Uh, earlier you had talked about going to SUNY New Pulse and at the beginning, not necessarily recognizing the prominence of the instructors or some people within the program. Um, and then this discussion kind of like sharing oral history and tradition within the family. Were there mentors for you or are there currently mentors for you within the field? I think especially within metals, I find mm -hmm. that there's such a lineage that exists. Uh, do you find that there are people in there for you? I definitely gained mentors in school. So before it was like self-driven, like before going to school, like none of the instructors, almost none of the instructors that I had at, at Pratt, at the community center, like mentored me because they were all like trying to do the hustle. They're trying to teach and make money. And, you know, they didn't come in after hours or anything like that. And, um, but when I went to college um, and because I was like, you know, a non-traditional student, I was much older. I was actually friends with one of my instructors. Um, and so we would, we would hang out and um, we were, the, I'm actually older than him. <laughs> so we would, you know, we hung out and we had, an, you know, we were adults together <laughs> and we didn't have to talk about school and things that had to do with school, right. you know, and, um, and uh, that was cool. And then, um, but Jamie Bennett um, invited me to be his assistant at Haystack when I graduated. And that had a huge impact on my life. I had never known a place like that. Like I'd never known like a craft school that you could go to and like be a camper and be an adult and make work. Like I had no idea that existed. That was not something that was ever, I was ever exposed to growing up. Um, and then I have since become friends with all the staff there and have taught there. And now I'm on the board 
uh, it's the first board I've, I'm, I've ever been on. Um, and it's an amazing board of like over 60% artists and professionals of color. I mean, it's just like insane. Like the way that that one um, relationship with, with my teacher and that one instance of him inviting me to come to that place has really changed my life. Um, and all of my college professors have af actually influenced me in all positive ways. Um, I think that's kind of our job as college professors is to provide opportunities for young people and expose them um, to different um, pathways and different um, opportunities. It's in it's, it is our job to be doing that. Um, and I certainly had, you know, a group of folks that, that did their job. I love, I love that uh, example of Haystack and just kind of the trajectory of meeting Jamie and moving all the way through that to the board. And I think it's crazy. Know, it, it's wild. And I, that's honestly what I'm most passionate about when it comes to this field and craft is that the way that we are in community with one another and the way that we share experiences. And certainly I feel like it's a responsibility as an organization that we have to create space for that continuum. Um, so um, it's really, it's positive yep. for me 100. to hear you say that about another craft organization. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. This has like been a really engrossing conversation like I've, I've really enjoyed learning about you and your process um we are coming close to the end but before we go we um like to close out with something just a little while light and just for funsies um we asked you what are the three songs that describe your work were you able to come up with three songs that you would like to use to describe your work uh yes <laughs> <laughs> and is one of so, them the double um, Dutch bus. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and you know, it's so funny as I was trying to think of things that describe my work. No, but like maybe my, my trajectory okay. of like becoming an artist. Um, there's this song by Metallica called Nothing Else Matters. Huh. <laughs> And um, Cocteau Twins, which is my favorite band, um, they have a song called See, Swallow Me. Hmm. And uh, Faith No More has a song called Midlife Crisis. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a lot of rock. I like, you know, I like, I like rock music, but I also love like kind of ethereal, um, spacey, yeah. like, 4 AD, 80s music. Okay. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> I like that. And um, I yeah, and I totally I, I get that vibe off you like that. That that feels right. It feels right to me. <laughs> also, like, is it do you do you listen to this stuff as you're as you're working or are you just totally like silent? Are you in a silent studio? No, I, I listen to quite a bit of music. And my husband is a drummer and percussionist. Oh. So there's always music happening. Um, I. Uh, mostly listen to podcasts lately mm. but um i do listen to a lot of cocteau twins because i don't have to concentrate on it because the way that elizabeth fraser sings you actually can't mm. understand any of the words she's saying <laughs> it it's beautiful it's beautiful um and sometimes i'll be in like a rock mood so like faith no more or metallica or slayer mm. like i'm i'm really into that um and yeah, podcasts. I've been listening to, um, <laughs> there's an amazing podcast called The War Report. Hmm. And it's uh, two comedians. It's Shalewa Sharp and um, Gastar Amante. Mm -hmm. And they're hysterical. And they, they talk about like two or three like interest topics, um, like two or three like s stories that mm -hmm. they choose. And it's pretty funny. And then... Um, I've been listening to, of course, a lot of true crime podcasts. Of course. Why not? Right. <laughs> um, yeah. And then I also love, one of my favorite ones is called, um, it's called um, I Saw What You Did. And it's two uh, black women who are talking about two movies. Uh -huh. So they pick two movies a week and they, they talk about those movies. Um, 
And that's a really fun one. Well, thank you so much, Tanya, for taking the time out with and hanging out with us. And um, Rachel, are you doing okay with the fangirling? I know that. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I have learned some new things today. I am excited about it. And well, and Tanya is going to be with us at Contemporary Craft right after this airs, which is also exciting. Oh, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. We've never met in person. I'm, I'm looking forward to actually meeting you in person. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's dope. I'm right. looking forward to it, too. And um, where can folks catch up with you or keep up with you online, Tanya? Um, so my Instagram handle is tmcrane613. That's actually my first middle initial, my last name, and then my anniversary. So tmcrane613 <laughs> <laughs> that I literally forget every year. We never celebrate our anniversary. We always forget. I have the it's same right problem. Near my birthday, so yeah, I have the same yeah. problem too. Because, but we luckily we had um, <laughs> buttons for our fa our wedding favors, and so they have the date on there. So I kind of mm -hmm. keep those around. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have a matchbox yeah. that I do sometimes. Like, what year did you get? <laughs> right. <laughs> yep. How many? How many years has it been? Yep. Right. <laughs> and then um, I tried to start one that was like all jewelry and. I never keep it up, but it's uh, Tanya Monique Jewelry. That's another Instagram I have. And then my website is Tanya Monique Jewelry. All right. Dot com. All right, folks. Well, yeah. And my Facebook is like Tanya Owens Crane. So that's like my maiden name, my last and my married name. All right on.